It's the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Tickers. Today, I'm talking with Rich Dom, a staff writer for the ABC TV show The Middle. Before that, he was the executive producer of The Colbert Report for most of that show's run. He's also written for The Ali G Show, Dennis Miller, and The Onion. You work on The Middle. I do. And are you an executive producer of the show? I am a, writer? a consulting producer. Okay, they have all these titles and all these names. For right. It, but essentially, is it a writer? Or it's, a, it's a writer. They're Basically, all kind of everyone, yes. For, there's an executive and executive producer, co executive producer, uh, staff writer, story editor, they all basically are writer. There's some differentiation in, in depending on the show, There, you might get some more duties at a higher level. But basically, it boils down to the exec- the showrunners and then everyone else's writers. So. so on the middle, what is your role? I am a writer, basically. I'm one of the right one of the writers. Okay. So it's but we also I also do some, you know, some producing like when, when it's my turn to do my episode i have to i have to go to the all the meetings for the you know figuring out what's what is needed for the episode what sorts of props what sorts of you know costumes wardrobe oh really that's yeah that sounds almost like line producing uh well i I don't have to worry about where the money is coming from i just have to go in i we we just have a we will sit around a table and this is i think every show does something like this you know where you sit and you talk to all the various people to find out what it is uh, is need, that is need for the episode? You just go through page I see. So you by have a page. conduit with the production team. Yeah, to so tell we can what like stuff we'd say you know we'd say oh we're going to need this, and then we'd give specifics for what it is. You know we're going to need a certain kind of vase, for example. I see. Like, I don't have. I've never worked on an episode where we needed a vase, but you know right, that's so, an example. And how is it working on that show? It's terrific. It's really it's been a great experience. Uh, Not every experience working on tv shows is great no it's it's a so it's, you've worked on a few i've worked on a few i've been very lucky that uh, almost all my experiences have been terrific i mean they really have i've gotten something out of all of the things i've worked on something positive to take from it but this is a, a great show to work on i love the other writers i work with it's a a very doable schedule some sitcoms have you know really rigorous like late <laughs> late hours this that is not the case with the middle um, the cast is terrific. The crew, everybody I work with is great. Um, so I don't have any complaints. Uh, and it's a show that I love on top of it. So it's all good. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. it, it uh, harkens back to your comedy roots, which we'll get to. Right. But let's step back to your job before this. Yes. You're, you're in L.A. now working in Hollywood. I on, am. On the middle Previously, you were the EP on the Colbert Show. Yes, I was a co-EP, technically co-EP, co-EP but I had the role basically of an EP, of an EP. Understood. So, I I didn't make like there was there was Stephen and then a guy named Tom Purcell who were the EP who were the executive producers on the show, but I had uh, basically a role that was similar to that. Uh, I was like basically one step below them, but I made all plenty of. Uh, big decisions on the show yeah so. what was your what was your job what did that look like at colbert i was hired along with allison silverman who had worked at the daily show to head write the show i had no uh producing experience at that point and together we were we would assign stories and figure out what was going to be on the show with steven did you have a hand in uh putting together the writing staff as yes well? we went through we would read submissions we asked for a packet from everybody um, you know, from agents, agencies, um, and then they, they, they would basically say, we need a, you know, right. We had like guidelines for what we want, the kind of things we were looking for in the packet or in the early run, we didn't know what the show was exactly. We had an idea of what it was going to be, but we asked people to sort of write in what the voice, they think the voice of Steven is, and they would pitch out some ideas and then Based on what was in those packets, we hired a certain number of people. Yeah, because his character of sort of the fake right wing blowhard, from what I recall, was not really evident on the Daily Show. He was a correspondent who did pieces, but you didn't really know what his personal political views were necessarily. Is that right. right, that's true. He was he was a version of that character, a version, sort of a version of the character, but not specifically a conservative right wing. He was. A softer version of what he became on right. the Daily, or like, became on Colbert, on the Rapport. Yeah, like what Bill O'Reilly would have been had he worked for some other 
right. pro- producer as a reporter on some smaller station before getting to Fox, which exactly. I think he did. Yes. So that all makes sense. Okay. So the, then- the, the, actually, the the whole show started as a of sort of fake interstitial that they had on the daily show it was a uh, sort of a mock promo for a show called the colbert report i remember that and it, they did like two or one or like a couple two or three of them and ben carlin who was the executive producer on the show i believe it was him said we should make this into a real show and uh and steven was into it and that's how the whole thing was born so yeah so you you sort of had these um I don't even know what you'd call those. They're like taped proposals that you could send to the network and say, right. it'll be like this. Right, right, and, right. And um, were you a part of, was there a pilot? There was no pilot. The pilot was the first eight, the first eight weeks of shows that we did. They, so, they, <laughs> they, 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 uh, they committed to eight weeks. So they rightly assumed that this would work. They, and they, just saw those interstitials and didn't need to see anything else. They're like, yep, we're doing yes, this. Yes, exactly. We, yeah. uh, Comedy Central uh, was very, was pretty hands off on it because, you know, we were, John Stewart was involved, and so they they had the confidence. And they were the, the flagship show, exactly. So there, we didn't have a lot of network interference. That network was always, you know, it was always uh, they didn't get in our way. Let's just say that's great. So you were brought in right at that juncture when they agreed to do these eight shows, right? They had the show had been pitched to the network. They liked it, and then they were, and then there was a search for head writer, and that's when. And I knew Ben from The Onion, and he thought I might be someone who would be good. And so I flew to New York from L.A. to meet with Stephen, and we hit it off. But, you know, I was nervous because at that time I had not, like I said, I had not produced a show myself. Uh, and that's when Allison Silverman was also someone who was had was had done great work at The Daily Show. So as a team, we... And hadn't were, she been at Conan prior? She was also at Conan, yeah. So she was a very experienced producer. She was very experienced. She was a very exper- Yeah, more experienced than me, certainly. But... Uh, so it was a trial by fire for me a little right. bit. Uh, but, but Ben had the same experience on The Daily Show. Yeah, he was brought in. So uh, he probably pitched hard for you. Yeah. And so I pulled up stakes here and moved to New York. It's I know The Daily Show for a while had a reputation for being a very sane daily comedy show. Yes. Where it didn't have crazy hours like a lot of other comedy shows. People yes. People weren't working till you know, midnight mm-hmm. and then coming in at 10 how was it on Colbert? Was it similar? Was the it same was, culture? It was similar. Transferred? That was it was similar. We tried to keep to that model of of for the writers it being a ten to you know ten you know nine thirty to about six o'clock. So no one was there late unless they had to work on something. No one was required to be there late after that. After yes. that time. So I want to dig in on those writers just a little bit more. When you sent out the feelers, when the agents sent out the feelers, mm-hmm. you got a bunch of submissions, mm-hmm. and you didn't really have Stephen's character voice nailed. Did the submissions help you? They were, did you see some that were like, oh yeah, like that's how he could be. That could be funny. Did they help shape him at all? I, they did. They did to some extent. I mean, we were more at that point. We Stephen had a pretty good idea of what he, how the character was going to be. We just knew things that weren't in his voice more so than like we more. It was more of a process of eliminating the things we knew were not correct. As it often is. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe there were a couple things that came from submissions that we ended up doing on the, sh- from the submissions of the people that we, that we picked up mm-hmm. uh, that and we ended up doing on the show. I cannot recall them now, but uh, I'm sure it's a blur. It, I thought everything was a blur. Yeah. <laughs> it's a blur. Um, it was mostly we've had like I when I came on the show was going to start in October. I came on in August, uh, moved out in August, and we spent those two months or month and a half figuring out what two well two and a half months I guess figuring out what what is a part of the Colbert Report show. We knew we were going to do something that like. What O'Reilly did, his you know his talking points memo. We knew we had to do something like that, and that yeah. was what became the word. And we also needed refillable bits that we were gonna that we knew that you know so something to throw jokes into, where we're, you don't have to come up with a, something from whole cloth every time. And so we had many refillable bits that sort of they the list of those grew over the years. Um, and it, it, you know, once you have that, when you have that format, you, it's, a, it's easier to, you know, with the onion, it was that way too. You'd have a certain type of format to how the news story would be done. It makes it, it, it helps make it easier to write the jokes, to fill it. Um, 
And aside from stories, just having different features that are different sized boxes. You yes. Can put them together differently every week and come exactly. up with a different show. Exactly. A and unique seeming show. Exactly. Because there's, there was a, you know, I know I can speak for myself and say, I was concerned when I came on, is this a show that we can do every day? I wasn't 100% confident that it was something that could be done every day, but did you express Niners. that skepticism? Um, I didn't. I don't think I ever expressed it. Um, uh, there was a, sp- a time when David Cross came into the show. He was going to work on something with us, and he w- we were he was going to do a uh, character, which he did he do. Did a, do he yeah. did. He did do the character a few times, and he came in and he was talking to us about it. And he said, "Well, now we now would this be something we do every week?" And we're like, "Well, no. This is a strip show. This is every day." And he turned around and he looked at the board because we had. We had put up the card, you know, the cards for the board, and he was like, "Oh, oh, this is a daily show, daily." <laughs> like that was early on. That was in the uh, like in the the pre production days. Wow. So, and yeah, when you see David Cross's confidence shaking, you know something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, Stephen probably never. Um, Stephen has showed any. If he did, he never he doubt. Uh, he was always he's always been he's such a great collaborator and he's somebody who is he's so full of he's full of ideas he you know he is no i don't think he ever maybe he did if he did it was uh, private the that he was worried about it but the show we had so many like we once we started doing it we realized there was we could build his character in many different ways through the various bits we were doing so uh um it didn't take long to realize it was gonna work um, you know, we got picked up one, it was less than a week. It was a week. Wow. We'd been on one week and then we got the, we got the pickup, which was fantastic. For how long? For a year. Wow. So we didn't do the 13 week, 13 week, 13 wow. week. It was a full year. But uh, as I recall, the show's debut, uh, was pretty seismic. It was it, pretty popular pretty quickly. Yeah, it was, I think it helped that Stephen had established himself so well and he's so you know um, and they had the lead in they had the perfect lead and it was the and then we then we would do the sort of the toss we called it between the two shows sure. so that so it was a seamless transition it's from like one the daily show, show to the just other. got longer exactly <laughs> everyone's exactly. favorite show is now an hour exactly um and we for to be to you know in the beginning we, we did the we did those tosses between the two shows yep and I think that helped, certainly helped. It, it held the audience better than any, I think, anything that ever came after The Daily Show before that or after. And what Daily year shows. are we talking about? Is this like, oh. Okay, 2005. Five. October 17, so, 2005 yeah, is when the show started. People are still watching on TV. They're not watching on the internet yes. at that point. At so that point. That sort of like the time that it's on mattered more. Yes. Yeah. So tell us about the blur. Like it, it was really a meteoric success. It was a pretty show. much and a like success out of the you box. Were like sitting in the White House, and I just kind of <laughs> want to get a sense of like how that felt and how you and the writers dealt with that. It was a, incredible fame, still just daily doing the grinding work of putting yeah. out a funny show, right? To live up to all that hype. Well, I will say because we were in the thick of it. Uh, speaking only for myself, I was—we were in the thick of put, trying to put together a show every day, and it's the gaping, hungry maw of material that you have to fill every day. You don't spend a lot of time paying attention to what are the critics saying, what do people think of it, what do you do? Like maybe so you didn't in really the beginning, see or feel a lot of that stuff. Not at not I, maybe in the beginning, I was sort of checking to see what people thought of it, but it. Once I knew that it's people seemed to like the show, I stopped paying attention to that, and I never paid attention to the ratings. Like in the beginning, we sort of would read what the ratings were, but then it just it stayed fairly consistent. So it was like I don't care. Like I can't let that dictate what we do on the show. We just have to do what we think is funny. And um, I will say the first two years, especially for me, were were amazing. It was because I'd never worked on anything like that before, and. It, there was such a buzz about it, and we did the, those. You know, we did those first eight weeks of shows, and then Stephen did the White House Correspondence Dinner, which I was and I was there for that. You helped write his. I piece, helped. Right? I helped write. There were a number of writers on it. I was one of many who who worked on it, and uh, but I was one of the people because I was uh, a head writer on the show. I got to go with him, and Alice and I got to go with him, and it was a. It, I, it, we didn't think that it was going to have the the impact that it did. We certainly just were there to do jokes and hope that people liked them. And 
and and we thought that the material we didn't think the material was going to burn the room or anything like that we just thought it was uh we were just doing funny jokes the same kind of jokes we would do on the show and we thought it was going to be well received and there was there were laughs there were people laughing in the room but it was it had a it had followed a piece that like the bush had done that where he was had a double and that killed like the room loved it because they were like oh the, the president's making fun of himself hilarious so then it's hard to follow that to begin with but then i've been told that everyone looks at the president to see how he's responding to the jokes and he was not responding well he did he was not laughing and I would, Stephen would do a joke, and I'd look over at the president, and he'd just be sitting there stone faced. And uh, I wanted to get, like, when it was over, I just wanted to get the hell out of Washington as fast as I could. Did Bush understand the joke? Did he understand? I think Stephen he understood. I think he did understand. I mean, I don't know if he understood because the show was pretty new at that point. Yeah, and a lot of people didn't understand yeah. that he was playing a character. Yeah, and the thing that was. Like normally that gets a lot of press, the the White House Correspondence Center. It didn't get any, like none it of the newspapers were negative press. Well, it it got it, when it started to get press, it did get negative press. But on the internet, it was a sensation. Like people were, you know, people were like praising Steve. Yeah, I thought left it was right. brilliant. I thought it was so funny, and it was so great to see it done. Uh, it was almost incomprehensible see, looking at it from the outside yeah. to imagine that the people in the room yeah. had this like feeling that it was bombing or right. that Bush didn't like it. You know, right. it just was so funny to see the video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had a, <laughs> at first I was like, did we, were we too harsh? Were we too mean? <laughs> and I'm like, the no, poor, we weren't too mean. Poor president. Poor president. And then, I, but then I realized, no, he's the most powerful man in the world. You've got to, got to take him down a few. But we weren't there to like to. We weren't there to take him down a few no, pegs. We were I, there I mean, just to be funny. Yeah, and ultimately it's it. his fault because yeah. he should have smirked because that's his job to right. take it, take it like a man and and take a joke about himself. Right. But he had to be petty about it and <laughs> and not like it and not smile. So, but, uh, and, and that directed the rest of the audience too. Yeah, totally. Looked at him and he wasn't laughing. So everyone was like. Ugh. Right. But there were people laughing in the room. It wasn't like there yeah, was no laughing. Laugh, so. But as uh, Stephen pointed this out uh, somewhere, um, they don't mic the audience. They mic only him because it's C-SPAN. So you only hear what he's saying. And so you can't hear any of the laughter. They would cut occasionally to, I think, Scalia. Would, <laughs> there's some shot of Scalia. He was enjoying it, actually. He was laughing pretty That's hard. Right. But... Uh, uh, it was a uh, is an experience, definitely. I'm glad I am glad I was there, and uh, I'm glad we got a chance to do those jokes. It definitely gave the show even more visibility than it already had. I think I think that contributed. You know, people wanted to check it out. Um, What's another crazy highlight moment from those uh, boom years on the show? Um, my favorite episode uh, of the show of all time was Guitar Mageddon. Now this is going to take a little while. A little bit of explaining to get to it because it's so insane so what what was really amazing and fun about those for early years is the internet and youtube youtube was just getting started at that point and so um we had we had a bit that we did uh called um better know a district where we would talk about uh, we Stephen would interview uh uh um, a representative from a district and then before but prior to it we do a little series of jokes about the district and what's in the district and we were doing the uh, same district that uh, um, Lucasfilm or uh, Industrial Light and Magic is in and so we ended the bit with him Stephen standing in front of a green screen and um, and like doing sort of he wasn't doing the Star Wars kid specifically but he was like swinging a lightsaber around and he said we're going to add special effects to this later well the the folks out there in in uh, the internet land decided to take it upon themselves to actually make videos and some of them were really good so we're like this is this is basically you know uh, we should we gotta, we gotta tap into this so um, we had a little what, what we'll call a green screen challenge and we played some of the best ones on 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 the show. And about six months, so, and then that was great. And then George Lucas came on the show, and it was that was very fun. And we, uh, 
year months later we had uh, the Decembrists. It was a uh, an indie band. They decided uh, to have their own green screen challenge, and so Stephen, the character, was angry about this and went on and challenged the uh, the members of the Decembrists to a shred off with the with the guitar, and so that was called Guitar Mageddon. Well, that show, which was our last show of the of that of that year, ended up ballooning into this huge production so like steven was taking sort of this what the, was this is this tiny little thing and blowing it up which mm-hmm. and that last show um it had like this incredible list of guest stars involved with it him the, having this this little battle with a guy from an, of some indie from an indie band he had we had um elliot spitzer as a judge, this is you know pre pre scandal. Yeah. Um, we had uh, it opened with Morley Safer talking about the uh, like a, it was like a sixty minutes promo open. We had uh, Henry Kissinger to, <laughs> kicking it off, and then what, what happens in the in the battle is Stevens Stephen he cuts his finger when he's trying to do the his his side of the shred off. And Peter Frampton shows up and plays in his wow. place. And then also uh, Rick Nielsen, actually, from Cheap Trick. Cheap Trick did the theme song to the show. They came in. It was just this crazy, crazy show. But it was so fun. and we. But it was all thrown together kind of in a very short period of time. It just was a great, uh, just a really fun way to end that two, that two years, I think of as like, my favorite year, <laughs> that uh-huh. that year and a half, I should say, on the show, because it was like there was just it was just it was an excitement about it, and people were just excited about the show and the I, and the writers. I had one of the writers came up to me when we were pulling that show together, and he said, "How does it feel to be working on the hippest show on television?" I'm like, oh, "That's great to hear that." I don't, you know. Uh, oh, it definitely was. It, it was just a lot of fun, just a really a lot of fun to work on that show. And it was, you know, there's, I can't say that it, there wasn't grueling times and it got, you know, Steven is such a joy to work with and so fun. And uh, we had such great writers, just great. So we're going through your career backwards here, which is fine. What were you doing before the Colbert show? Well, before Colbert, I had been, uh, I was actually working at The Onion, which was actually the second of my two stints at The Onion. I'm going to pass over that and talk about other stuff since the onion sort of will put all that together into one into one discussion but i had been just sort of working on uh i've been trying to find work in uh los angeles as a writer i had moved out to la um after i got married in 96 to work originally on the internet and then a group of uh of us Ex Onion writers decided to f- like form a writing team, and we went and we uh, sold a pilot, and we sold a uh, a movie to Judd Apatow, and this is before Judd Apatow was the Judd Apatow, um, you know, Judd Apatow of capital today. letters. Uh, but um, you know, none of neither of those things really went anywhere. They were they we it got us some work, but we sort of went our separate ways, and I started looking for various jobs and I spent about a I spent a season on Dennis Miller Live which was as his last season and then I worked uh, for a season on Ali G the Ali G show um, and then I worked on a variety of other things other sitcoms like that were or like little catch as catch can sort of work that's sort of what that first nine years was like for me in show business a lot of like 13 weeks of work and then nothing <laughs> and uh, you know Four weeks of work, then three you know three months of no work, and then six months. It's a lot of a lot of downtime. Just when I was getting started. Let me take you back to '96. Uh, you went out there to work on the internet. Yes. You were literally. This is 1996. Yeah. You were like programming websites. Yeah, I was and writing for these embryonic. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I I went out there. Uh, I'd always wanted to move out there but I had never I never had a I didn't know anybody so when Dan Weber who was my assistant editor when I was at the onion moved out there to work on uh, a magazine he uh, he he moved out there to work on a magazine and then he got involved with this internet group 
uh, film threat magazine. Film, film threat magazine, and then he started. He they were starting a film based internet site that we were that had like a sensibility of the onion not yeah. fake news stories but like that attitude almost like the av club maybe kind of like the av club yeah. and we it was yeah it was called film zone and we did that for about a year but it was you know this is in the day before there was no revenue coming in we were getting paid but yeah, it, I don't was think like it was like black brilliant. screen with like bright green letters yeah it was know, the early days of html early. and right and uh, you guys are program you're doing uh, html we're program. programming our own html page <laughs> right, right. and uh but we're also writing reviews and uh and it was uh, like that wasn't what we came out to to do but it was you know it was a fun year of that but then w- once we started getting some you know attention because of the work we'd done at the onion we decided to move on to like one of the things of doing like writing reviews is you st- i started feeling like well i'm criticizing other people's work i'd rather be writing my own why right. am i you know who am i i'm just some guy i might as well you know i have experience writing funny stuff why don't i might why am i not writing funny stuff instead of writing reviews for things so that was that's why I sort of wanted to leave that. Okay, so uh, before going out to Hollywood, tell us a little bit about your Onion years. Okay, so I graduated from college in 89, and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I had a girlfriend in Madison, uh, and The Onion had started the year before, and I had always loved it and thought it was really funny. Uh, and a friend of mine, Matt Cook, wrote on it. He told me he told me about it when it started, and it sounded fun. But he was, I, the, he was the first writer. He was the first writer, uh, uh, and uh, he, after the first year of the Onion, there was a totally new ownership, <laughs> as you may remember. I do recall. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, at the time, I was, you know, I was doing just odd jobs to make a make ends meet, so I could stay near my girlfriend. And so I was working as a courier uh, <laughs> and uh, driving a school bus and. Uh, what else did I do? I was telemarketing for a while and I gave the onion a call and said, I would, I would like to write for you. And I talked to, I talked to a guy named Scott Dickers <laughs> yeah. and said, I have, I would love to write for you and you, and you suggested that I write something and send it. And what so a crazy suggestion. Yes, I know. I Show don't know. me some of your, <laughs> some of your work. <laughs> so, uh, I wrote a piece about the Wisconsin Dells. It was sort of a, sarcastic snarky little piece about the dells which you had worked at in the summer i had when worked you were a there teen. i'd worked there in the summers <laughs> right uh during actually while i was in college oh okay and so i had a, you know an insider's view of of uh the dells um, and i wrote it and you said ah, it's pretty funny and then you and then you know i wrote and you put put it in the paper, and then I sort of hung around the office <laughs> and bugged you some more. But you were also very like welcoming, and you were like you you saw something in me, and so you let me come and hang out at the office. And I remember, I distinctly remember when I realized that the onion was a thing I had to do. Is I was, I was had this telemarketing job that was giving that was making me money and driving the school bus, and it was just miserable, as you can imagine. I, we were, I, we were calling people, cold calling people to try to sell them premium channels. It was the, it was a nightmare, a nightmare. Um, and, but I was also at the time coming and hanging out at the office with you and like, just like helping write little jokes for things and this and that. And I, I remember being sitting there, being in that office, sitting in my little Carol, like just being miserable. And I just stood up, walked out. And said, "I'm done. I can't do this anymore." And I came right to the Onion office, and I think I told you about it. I said, "I'm, uh, I quit my job. <laughs> I think I quit my job." Uh, and uh, and uh, after that, not long after that, you offered me sort of a regular position there uh, at a at a pauper's wage, <laughs> but it was a <laughs> yeah. But when, you know, when somebody quits their job, uh, yeah, yeah, they can do something. Yeah, it's, uh, but it was. Uh, those early years were just incredible. We would sit around. I remember you and I would just laugh, and I'd sit. You, you'd sit at the one computer we had, and I'd sit by your side, and you'd be typing, and we'd be just adding jokes and editing and changing things. And uh, and then uh, we'd. Sit, I remember one 
glorious evening where we decided to come up with all the headlines for an entire semester. We stayed uh, up all night. All I night. Did, I remember that as well. Just fueled pizza by Coca-Cola and, and pizza. Yeah. And, uh, and just came up with, a, uh, I think, six months worth of yeah. front page headlines. Yeah. And it was, that a, was crazy. It was, a, it was a delight. And even though, you know, not a lot of pay, it was a, just a, a great training ground, just a great place to work just to write whatever you felt like writing, you know, in, and, and, uh, have that kind of freedom and 15,000, 20,000 people would read it. It was great. Yeah. And, uh, so then I did that and then eventually I became, you made me a managing editor and then I, then we started trying to bring in other people. I knew people from, you and I both knew people from the daily Cardinal who you who we brought in. I had friends that I brought in, uh, to write, for the for the paper, we also had the fire the the what is a buyer's market? What was the what was that book called that we would that we had a we had a uh, the writers market writers market. Thank you, the writers market book where we, where people from anywhere in the country could submit, and of course those were always very useful. <laughs> Yeah, people who were in their 60s and retired and had time to write and yeah. wanted to write. And, and so they would write um, their crazy, uh, um, you know, uh, stories about their wife's cooking. Exactly. So. Uh, yeah, those were fun. Those were fun, magical times. Yeah. So let's take you back then before The Onion. Mm -hmm. um, that was your first kind of professional comedy job. Yes. Um, but... You obviously had a mind to a comedy mind. Yes. Because you thought to call the onion, you wanted to get involved, you wanted to do it, you were pretty good at it. What sort of amateur comedy things had you done prior to the onion? Well, I hadn't done a lot that was that I sh was showing anyone. Like I had, um, like in high school, I would write. I wrote like funny poems, and you get them published in the, uh, uh, you know, in the whatever the the literary magazine of the high school, like just, and I had a very, I had a sort of an absurdist sense of humor at that time. Very like deadpan and non sequiturs were, I loved. Uh, and I, then I went to college and then I originally dabbled a little in, in improv, but I just, I, for whatever reason, I got so involved with whatever I was doing in school or, you know, and is this Ma UW Madison? This is in Madison, the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and uh, I just it I, I it fell to the wayside. I sit like Todd Hansen, who also is at the Onion, was my roommate next door in the, in uh, in the dorms. Which dorm? Or not my roommate in in the dorm uh, in the dorms? I don't remember what the dorm was in, in Madison. Ooh, oh, witty. Witty Hall. Witty Hall. But he was on the floor. Same he was floor on the same floor next door. He wasn't a roommate. He was. He just lived right next right. door. And so we, we, and we both knew him separately. We knew him separately. And we just knew him as a really funny guy. And we yeah, had to get him super on staff talented. at some point. Yeah. Yes. And so he really, he and I just bonded early on, even though we couldn't be more different people. In, if I mean, in terms of personality-wise, like, personality very different people. But we, we just hit it off and... Uh, and so we would just stay up late. We did the, it's the staying up late is a big factor. And the we comedy just, happens at night. Yeah, we'd come up with just stupid ideas of like, <laughs> of like Christmas specials. Like we had one called uh, the uh, Chucky the Christmas Sloth that I we pitched that. out. Yeah. A lot of those came back once you guys yeah. were at the Onion. But yeah. uh, so you had no outlet. You had no publication you had At no the, show but you guys were just coming up with stuff we're just coming up with stuff just for fun, for fun. just coming up with funny ideas and we <laughs> right. wrote them we'd write them down but we never did anything with them right. we just um uh and so yeah no i never did any performing really the onion was sort of the first place other than like a high like high school um Those literary poems. magazine my funny right. poems and stories that i never that i ever really did anything that was public. So why did you start doing those things, and how early? Were you sort of a cut-up kid, or had you always just needed some kind of outlet for your brain to pour out these funny songs and funny poems and stuff? Or Yeah, well, when I was... Was there a reason? Girl, there was <laughs> There wasn't a... The girls came... The girls were later, but when I, uh, when I was a, a kid, I always wanted to be the class clown. I, that was just the thing I always... 
I strive to be, but I never was. There was always someone who was funnier than me. And I always wanted quicker. to... Quicker. I was quicker and funnier. Yeah. When I moved from one city to another, then I was in a new school, and there was a brief period where I actually I sort of accomplished that. And then I went to junior high and was a very insecure person, and so I withdrew with the, I withdrew into myself and didn't want to... Didn't socialize a whole lot for for those early, like, 7th and 8th grade. Why was that, do you suppose? I don't know. I think I was just... You know, you get the you get told that oh, when you get to junior high, things are going to be different. It's going to get really hard, and so I was really determined to not like fail at school. You know, I was always oh. a good student. I was always an excellent student. So I don't know why I worried about that. I don't really know. It's like what happens to the mind when you turn into a teenager. You just go crazy and you start. You know, I became really shy and I did just the dorkiest things like I was afraid that someone would break into my locker and so I carried all of my books with me to class that's great so I was a walking comedy bit already <laughs> right. so I you know frequently get drop all my books in the hallway and Wonderful. Um, yeah it was a delight because you didn't have an outlet anymore for your comedy aspirations because you were now mm -hmm. in more insular Mm -hmm. Maybe the the comedy just had to come out a different way, and so yeah. it came out in writing. Right, um, exactly. I was consuming a lot of comedy. I was hu a huge fan of George Carlin, Steve Martin, uh, Andy Kaufman, uh, early Saturday Night Live, SCTV, the, and I was would consume all the comedy I could get my hands on. Um, but I wasn't necessarily. It wasn't really for another couple of years that I started to generate it. And it was just really on a whim, just because it was fun. It was just fun to sit and write funny poems and stuff. And I, it was also like, I got bored in school with the idea of writing like essays on things I didn't give a shit about. So I would try to write something that I thought was fun and funny instead. And that's, I mean, that's sort of, I guess, eventually led to the Onion, like writing for the Onion. Was, right. Um, yeah, I think I still have some of those old notebooks of where I wrote those. You know. published those. I don't, I don't know. So, I so uh, what kind of a home life did you have? What kind of a childhood? Um, I had a very, did, I had did comedy come out of that at all? Or um, uh, was it a really serious house? Not a, I wouldn't say it was a serious house. I would say that my, my, I, my dad is a plumber and my mom is a, was a, uh, a stay-at-home mom. So, and my, dad's, my dad can be kind of a cut-up. Uh, and my mom loves like slapstick comedy. She loved like Jerry Lewis movies, and so I was I was raised on watching a lot of those sort of programmers, the Abbott and Costello movies, the Ma and Pa Kettle, like not highbrow comedy by any means, right. but um, watching a lot of and watching a lot of damn TV. Watched a lot, a lot of TV. <laughs> um, yeah, before the internet, you were like the guy who we would go to for answers. Like, yes. What was the name of that one actor on that one TV show? You knew everything. I I did. I I I still am that guy, sort of at the you know at the middle. I'm the guy who has the answers now. So I they guess. don't have to go to the internet. Right. I do use the internet though. We actually came up with a funny game called "Don't Look It Up," where it's like oh, you got to yeah. try to come up with yeah, yeah. the it's answer without looking it up. So. so, yeah, it sounds like you pursued comedy just because you thought it was fun and not necessarily because you had any sort of burning need or desire to do it. It was an outlet for you that yeah. was fun. Yeah. I mean, I uh, sometime, I guess, in high school, and I decided I wanted to go into, into – I wanted to direct movies was originally what I thought I wanted to do. And it's a skill set that, that I don't have, <laughs> I didn't have then, Uh but writing, you literally just, all you need is a pad of paper and a pencil, and you can come up with stuff, and you can create whole worlds just, to, you know, w with very, you know, very few tools. It's magic. Yeah. And I and I liked that freedom to do that, like to be able to do that. And uh, maybe someday I will direct something, but I have, I have not really pursued directing as a, as a goal. Is your process evolved since those days when it comes to actually sitting down in front of the blank piece of paper and writing? Yeah, you know, I'm not, I, I don't have a lot of great, <laughs> I don't have a, a very rigid process, I would say. I had, I did when I was working at 
when I had a, like when I was working at Colbert, I had to sort of you know have a regular schedule of how I was going to do things. Um, when I sit down to uh, write something, I'll like a, a script. I will sit down and sort of come up with a sort of broad stroke outline. But a lot of it is is discovery while I'm actually writing it. I don't like I go like with a script. I'd come up with what the scenes are. You know, I need a scene that does this, a scene that does this, and this needs to happen. And then I would, and that, but I would not go in detail to coming up, coming up. This is on my own writing, not in the middle. It's a very different. We've it's a very detail details what detailed outline of what we're going to do. Uh, You're talking about a script that you might write, like a spec script, like a spec like script that. as okay. opposed to a script that I'm Assigned being paid, to yeah, to write. So my process, I don't have a regular sort of. Nine, like I get up at six in the morning and I start writing for two hours. Like I have not developed a, pro- a process that's that rigid yet because I've had a very like uh, a very sort of very varied sort of writing career where I've worked on a lot of different things with very different sort of schedules. So I haven't been I I have the discipline when I know I have to get it done, but I. I've had a little hiatus here where I intended to write something and I didn't write anything. So, uh, so truthfully, uh, I don't know what my process is. My process okay. changes with everything that I do. So your process is if, if it needs to happen by a certain time, you get it done. Exactly. All right. But when you're, when you are writing, do you like try to squeeze out a really awful first draft? Do you, tr- do you, edit while you're going are you a pretty good self editor do you get other people to look at it anything like i am that? definitely an edit while i go i edit i maybe that's i i definitely want to get it perfect on the page the first time which i know isn't going to be the case i will i will it will take me longer to do a first draft i don't some people like to do sort of a bad words version of something uh just to get it on a page other page and then go back and fix it I tend to sort of belabor it more when I'm actually writing it, but sometimes you know, and that, and then uh, it often means I end up rewriting sort of the same first ten pages over and over again, which uh, might not be the most efficient way to do it. But that's generally how it's worked for me. When it's when it's my own, when it's something that I'm writing on my own, as opposed to something that I'm being paid to write, then it's then it, the, my process is a little more, a little different, little. Uh, a little more like, okay, I'm going to work on this scene today, this scene today. Um, but do you still like try to get those perfect before you hand them in? Or do you do Yeah, well, well definitely try to get, before I hand it in, I try to get it perfect because someone else is going to judge it if it right. isn't perfect. But then you'll it, then like write, rewrite it 10 times. Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, there are always like, you know, so there'll be certain scenes that'll be, that'll, that'll just come naturally and easily. And then the other scenes that are a little harder. And so it just depends. Some, some scenes you just spend more time on. So, yeah. so my, that's, I guess that's my process. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll take it. So you said you've learned something from every job. What have you learned from the middle? I've learned that it is you don't have to be a, you don't have, I've, I guess I've kind of learned this from all my jobs, but you don't have to, working smart versus working hard. I've learned, I learned this from all, all my jobs. You don't necessarily have to put in long hours to create good work. You know, we have the, we're very, it's a very, like I said, it's very efficient the way we, we write. We don't spend a lot of time we do, you know, there's always some chit chat time that happens in on any show, but and this was clue, true of, of of Colbert as well. You just get right down into the work right away. Well, and for a daily show, they kind of you just have to. to. But a lot of weekly shows, the people will sit around and chat for a long time. Right, right, and it's you have to do that too. You have to like you certainly like especially when you're breaking stories on a on a sitcom, you're gonna go in, uh, you know directions and tangents and you're, and you're gonna end up talking about something that's not necessarily related to the story sure. but um having people who are who love what they're doing and and don't complain like and always be pitching always just have ideas and come in excited to work and you know pitch don't bitch as they say um it's very important, and on all the—I sh- mean, every writing job you have, you're going to have to—you have to pitch a lot. 
and always be ready with new things to pitch, pitching on jokes, pitching new ideas. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in the industry. If you're a writer yeah. or a creative person, you just always have to be you thinking all- about what's my next pitch, what's my next idea. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what about, what's the big lesson from Colbert? Um, well, we, um, yes anding is what I learned from, from Colbert. It's appropriate. Yeah. I had worked on a couple of, at the Onion. We had a tendency to be very harsh on on, no on but, ideas. I call it. <laughs> it was no but exactly, um, and that was you know I I contributed to that. Obviously, it was the culture. Yeah, it was it still a, is. Yeah, where you like you shoot down an idea if it's if it, if you don't like it and you're harsh about it. <laughs> uh, I tried that in a couple of places where I worked. Not popular. Not a popular way to not a, not a way to uh, endear yourself to others. No. So I um, so I learned especially from Stephen that he and he's great at this. He'll take an idea if he doesn't like it, he'll just sort of move on and not and you not belabor it. But if he even an idea he may not be super th- excited about, he'll come up with an idea to add to it and to come up with, you know, and, and shape it. And sometimes something that just seems like it doesn't have any hope will turn into something really funny and great. So the yes ending. And I also just from Steven learned the, and I learned this just from just all the jobs learned always be doing something always and don't say no and the yes ending applies to doing jobs as well especially when you're starting out do everything do you know if some you have a friend who wants to put on a play and you want and, and they ask you to do it say yes do it if if uh you know don't rest on your laurels and like Keep your work secret and like, oh, one day I'll I'll unleash my genius to everyone. You just have to do. You do, and then through that doing, you meet people and you get experience and you learn uh, new skills. And you never know who, who it is that you're going to meet that is going to that is going to be an important person for you in the future. Uh, you know, you, that person might be able to get you a job. You know, on something else and. Just do everything you can because you never know, especially early on, what the thing is. I had no inclination to write for television uh, when I when I first started at the Onion. I was, you know, I wanted to do movies. That was what I wanted. I didn't have any show business experience, and you know, the process of getting a r- movie written is so laborious, and it just takes forever. And television is much more writer friendly, and it's more in your churning the more you need to have product to put on the on the air mm-hmm. so there's just more opportunities in tv than there is in movies so that's how you spool a career together is yeah by yes ending and try not to be difficult don't be difficult don't be a crazy person that's a good good lesson don't like don't be a prima donna it's you there will be a time and a place for when you need to speak up and say i don't think this is working but you know I've been very lucky. Everyone I've worked with, everyone I worked with at the middle, everyone I worked with at at Colbert, those two in particular, uh, they were. It's all just you. They hire sane people, you know. So it's like you're not dealing with someone who's going to cause a lot of problems, right? Um, uh, that's a good lesson. Yeah. The Onion. Yes. What did you learn from the Onion? Uh, either stint. Either stint. Um, Both. Probably I learned more from the early stint. The the second stint, I had been working in Hollywood for a little while, and then I called. I I needed work. I needed a job, and I called the onion. I said, "Hey, would you have any interest in hiring me to do some editing?" And they did. Were interested, and I was writing and editing again, writing like news and briefs. And um, I just learned the. Uh, I learned how to craft a joke. I learned how to how to how to say the most with the least amount of words and make it. Make things pop, make the jokes pop, make them, you know, sing and pop. Popping and singing together, you know. <laughs> uh, it helped shape, it really helped shape my, I already had sort of an absurdist sense of humor to begin with, but uh, it really helped shape the kind of, the things that I find, you know, funny, I guess. You're like finding the, the sweet spot between what you find funny and what a general audience is probably going to Exactly, find it helped me to know, like we didn't get a, We'd get feedback from people, certainly, but um, 
it like we didn't really have anybody that was telling us like we, there was no service saying no boss. The, the audience thinks you should be doing more of this there was so it was very as i said before it was very freeing to have the opportunity to just write whatever you whatever you wanted to do um but to make it you know make it a uh appealing to an audience to read not just some crazy fiction story that you want to write we were we were and that was really when you and i were working together we were we both have you know we like jokes we're not (laughs) not so much interested in in you know the you know freeform jazz or whatever just writing something that's that's uh that's funny stuff yeah, and, that makes and it ultimately laugh. it's about it has to work with the audience exactly. or it's not going to work so exactly yeah that's a good lesson good lesson to learn yeah well it's been a pleasure rich it's been a pleasure scott to sit with you it's so nice meeting you you're <laughs> like <laughs> hey thanks for listening if you liked what you heard here there's a lot more plus tons of other great comedy writing resources at howtowritefunny.com